Greetings, everybody. My name is Todd Hart, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Plastic Oceans International. I want to welcome you um, all to now what is the fourth um, of our series of panel discussions for our Trees and Seas Festival. Uh, what is Trees and Seas? Well, first, uh, let's, let's kind of cover that first. Trees and Seas is an annual event. This is the first time we've ever done it. It's taking place in over 30 locations around the world. And we've got quite a few activities involved with that. We're planting over 100,000 trees around, uh, around the globe. We have over 100 beach and, and forest cleanups. Um, gosh, dozens of workshops, film screenings, music performances, and of course, these uh, these panel discussions that we're all joining now, which again, I thank our panelists who I'll introduce in just a moment for those and all of you um, who are joining here now from various points around the world. Um, with that, I do want to thank uh, Montes Wines, uh, who are our presenting partners for Trees and Seas. Um, their invaluable support has really been kind of the key to allowing us to offer literally every single part of our festival absolutely free uh, to those who want to participate in it. And we're very honored to have somebody very special from Montez Wines who I'll introduce in, in just a moment. Um, we do want to remind everybody that we are giving away five copies, hardcover, uh, uh, five copies of the hardcover edition of our all new book, Living Without Plastic. Um, it's a great book published by Artisan Books that we put together about a year ago and just was published here uh, just in the last several months. So those names will be announced at the end of the panel. So we'll put the five names up on the screen for everybody to see. And again, five of you will be randomly selected to, uh, to get those sent out to you. And we will mail those out within a week um, of today. Um, we want to remind everybody that, that you can certainly be uh, engaging with our panelists on this through the Q&A function. If you're on Zoom, there is the Q&A box at the bottom. And if you're joining from Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube, simply drop your questions into the conversation and we'll be sure to uh, be getting those to our, our moderator. Um, with that, what are we all here for? We're here to talk about climate change's impact on the wine industry, how environmental factors and consumer sustainability demands are shifting business models. Um, boy, there's, there's a lot going on from a warming planet, limited water supplies, natural disasters, and consumer behavior. They're all converging to force a change in how longstanding practices and norms within the wine industry are being taken care of. A diverse panel of experts will tackle such topics as how the environmental factors are changing growing methods, where they plant, when they harvest, and how they bottle and market uh, their products. With that, I'll ask our panelists to go ahead and turn their cameras on so I can uh, introduce them here. There we go. All right. First up, I'm going to introduce Aurelio Montez. Yes, he is with Montez Wine, the co-founder of Montez Wine, one of the most recognized personalities in the Chilean wine industry and really has been at the forefront of bringing Chilean wines to the world as really a, a respected and renowned area for growing um, I also want to point out that he additionally now serves for the second consecutive season as the chairman of the board for, for Wines of Chile. Um, again, some place where the wines of Chile are being brought to the world. So Aurelio, I, joy, I, I welcome you to the conversation and certainly thank you and your team for your support of Trees and Seas um, as our presenting partner. From there, I'm going to go to Genevieve, Genevieve Janssen. She is the chief winemaker for Robert Mondavi Winery. Um, she has received the very highest of honors from the French government honoring her services to agriculture. In 2010, she was named Wine Enthusiast Winemaker of the Year, certainly one of the highest honors within, uh, within the industry. And Dr. Elizabeth Wolkovic, she is, an, she is a, a Associate Professor of Forest and Conservation Sciences at the University of British Columbia, where she runs the Temporal Ecology Lab. Currently, she is studying how temperature and um, I'm sorry, how, how temperature and other factors drive phenology across North America, woody species, and how climate change impacts different wine grape varieties, phenology. Sorry if I uh, jumbled, uh, bumbled that up a little bit there, Elizabeth, but thank you so much for joining us um, from BC. And finally, our moderator is Allison Jordan. She is the Vice President of Environmental Affairs for the Wine Institute, where she has helped create the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance a nonprofit organization established by the Institute and the California Association of Wine Grape Growers to promote sustainability from grapes to glass. So with that, Allison, I'm gonna turn it over to you to start, I think, what should be a most engaging and interesting conversations. Thank you, Todd. Um, 
thanks so much, Todd. Um, I've been lucky enough to have a chance to work in the California wine industry for the past two decades. And I'm always happy to talk about our sustainability initiatives and how they also relate to climate change, both mitigation and adaptation. Um, before we get started, I thought it would be great if we could get a better sense of who is in the audience. So Latka, if you could please pull up the poll, we can check it out. Everyone have a chance to show and we can pull it up, the results. All right, so we have quite a few winery or vineyards, some retailers, restaurant tours, about 11%, um, other wine industry. So around half of us are somehow related to the wine, wine industry, but great to see some others from other businesses and nonprofits, et cetera. So thank you again for joining us. So I'm really excited to hear from all of our esteemed panelists as we discuss this really important topic. So I'll jump right in with some questions, but just a reminder, as Todd said, that there is that Q&A button. So feel free to add your questions there and we'll be sure to leave some time at the end to be able to address some of those. So Elizabeth, I'd like to start with you and ask for you to give us some context for our discussion today. So if you could share some of the science more generally about how our climate is changing, but also how this is impacting the wine industry around the world. Sure. Thanks, Allison. So many of you may know or have heard that globally temperatures have risen about one degree Celsius or close to two degrees Fahrenheit over the last approximately 40 years. So we usually compare this to a climate in the 50s or 60s or that area. One important thing to note is that global average that we so often report is unequal. So certain areas are certainly warming more than others. And to put it broadly, for wine growing regions, generally the more northern wine growing regions are warming and have warmed and will warm more and are warming more rapidly and higher elevations as well. So for example, in France, it's warmed about three degrees Fahrenheit or one and a half degrees Celsius on average. That's 50% more than the global average you hear. And I think gives some scale of how different some of these impacts are across the globe. Um, in France, we also have a good sense of the impacts compared to other regions because we have very excellent long term data. So in France, we have wine grape harvest records that go all the way back to the 1300s, um, thanks to the church, which did an excellent job of recording more or less when they were harvesting each year at various places around the country, especially in Burgundy. And from this, we can see that there is huge variability in wine grapes harvest dates anyway. So there are really late years and really early years, and that's part of the natural climate system that we have. But what stands out across all those centuries upon centuries of records is the last 30 or 40 years when wine grape harvests have gotten significantly earlier. That's one of the major impacts that I would say most regions are experiencing. And on average, it really depends how much earlier, depending on your wine grape style, your wine style, as well as where you are, how much it's warm. So in France, approximately two to three weeks earlier than 40 years ago for harvest dates. Some regions, some years, it can be up to six weeks earlier. So for example, if you were harvesting in October, in one of the recent extreme years, you might've actually been contemplating harvesting in late August or September, so a big impact. Um, when the harvests are earlier, it changes the sugar to acid ratio in the berries. So we have a slightly different type of berry often. And that's because we're sort of speeding up the ripening period. And we speed up that ripening period, we tend to get higher sugar berries, which leads to generally more alcoholic wine. So we've changed a little bit the profile of wine also. Um, most of the developmental stages on average are getting earlier, bud burst, flowering, verhaison. But I would say in addition to these larger shifts we see due to the changing climate, we change the climate, we change the weather. So um, more than just warming changes, we see changes in the frost dates. So for example, in France this year, they had an extremely widespread frost event. Um, arguably, up to 75% of vineyards were hit after bud burst with a frost, and they lost a ton of vegetation and potentially um, harvest as well. So this has been a big problem in Europe. In contrast, you don't see changing frosts as much that are impacting growers in California, um, at least in the spring. In fact, when I talk to growers there, they say, we don't even need our wind machines as often. So they don't see that impact. 
but they in turn are seeing changes in heat extremes. So especially during the critical phase of berry ripening during berry zone, we are seeing days and days of extremely high temperatures. And in general, warmer temperatures speed up development. That's why we have earlier harvest dates, earlier flowering. But when temperatures get really high up into the 30s C, above 100 Fahrenheit, plants actually stall out in their development. And that can have an impact on the berry in the end. So we have contrasting things happening across the developmental periods. Um, I think heat waves are definitely a big issue that different areas handle differently. France generally can't irrigate due to laws. Um, that might be changing, but in France in the last couple of years, they had heat extremes so high in Provence that growers I know had actually lost the entire um, vegetation and the flowers aborted. So they lost their entire harvest. The leaves looked burnt. The plant really did just burn on the vine. That's a known outcome, but we've never seen temperatures generally in France that high to have that outcome. In California and other areas, you can try to mitigate the heat by making the microclimate cooler. You can do that with irrigation, just put a lot of water on, or you can do it with a micro mist system where you actually water the upper vegetation and try to really cool down the local climate. Um, so there's really variable responses across regions. And I do want to just touch briefly on, of course, when it's hot, it dries out the soil, drier soil heats up the air. We have a positive feedback cycle where when it gets as hot as it has been, drier soil, hotter air, really dries out the vegetation, especially the natural vegetation and increases the fire risk. So it's unclear if we have more fires, depending on what region you're in, but we certainly have much bigger fires with climate change because it's much easier for those fires to spread. They have a lot of fuel. So certainly lots of regions are seeing that impact with climate change. Um, and one last thing, of course, what to do about it. And I've talked about some of these sort of things you can change in the moment, try to irrigate, try to deal with it. But certainly growers are thinking on larger scales. Growers with the cash capital are thinking about shifting where they plant. So every time I talk to someone in England, they tell me about the new wine growing region of Southern England that will be the new Champagne. It doesn't have the climate that Champagne had 30 years ago yet. It might in 20 or 30 years. And so they're trying to plant Champagne varieties there. Places like Champagne are thinking about whether they want to continue planting those varieties. Um, and certainly there's changes you can make in the place to keep the variety, but we have a huge diversity of wine grape varieties. We grow wine grapes from Germany all the way to Southern Italy and have been doing so for millennia. And those wine grape varieties are very different. The ones from the Southern areas generally take a long time to ripen. They withstand heat a little bit better than the one in the Northern region. So some growers are thinking in small ways about whether they want to change varieties or change where they are. I think that's a bit of an overview. That's super helpful. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I really appreciated that you covered or touched on how variable the, the impacts can be. And we're fortunate to have two different wine regions represented on the panel today. So Genevieve, I'll start with you and would like to know what does this mean for a vintner in Napa Valley? Have you experienced any changes on when or where or how you can grow grapes and make wine? And then also if you have seen impacts how is your winery or even the wine industry or region as a whole adapting to those changes? Well, could you please unmute Genevieve, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I spent 30 years in Napa Valley and I saw a big change. So when I arrived, it, there was uh, the, the way we were planting the vineyard was very different. We were 10 feet or 12 feet apart, uh, no irrigation, uh, very uh, goblet uh, training, so hand prune. And uh, we were not very much aware. I talked about 30, 40 years ago. We were not very much aware about the stress, hydric, hydric stress in the vines. Uh, the, the variety and the material of the vines were pretty much uh, with a lot of virus. So the, the, I recall Napa Valley being very red and uh, that was fine. And, um, and we had two rootstock to choose from. That was uh, St. George and um, um, the, um, the difficult um, uh, other uh, rootstock and uh, the one who, who had the phylloxera later on. And um, we, um, we were not to totally understanding the effect of the heat. We had the heat, but we were more, let's try to do our best. 
but we had an evolution and suddenly we had the phylloxera and the AXR1, the rootstock was 80% planted in Napa Valley. So 80% of uh, the rootstock uh, had to, and the, the vineyard had to be replanted. So it was, it gave an opportunity for the wine industry in Napa Valley to rethink everything. And that's where I saw the huge uh, shift in uh, replanting and managing the vineyard. So a lot of variety went down the, uh, closer to the ocean and closer to the um, uh, to the fog and the cooler uh, temperature. So now we are planting in the region of Carneros, which is south, close to the Bay Area and close to San Francisco, closer to San Francisco. Um, the, the Pinot Noir and the Chardonnay. And then uh, we have between, the Napa Valley is a very small valley. It's located very close to the ocean, has a Mediterranean uh, climate, and in the same time, influence of the ocean. So it's a very uh, sh short valley, five kilometer uh, of uh, width and 30, uh, 50 kilometers long. So it's comparable to Burgundy. And uh, in this uh, region, we have a complexity in the soil. We have a lot of microclimate. And through the year, like 40 years ago, we have evaluated uh, the different region and appellation. And so every region will have a different way of reacting to the, the, the global warming and the warmer temperature. So after we, we had to replant the, um, to replant the phylloxera, we saw the raw orientation changing after studying uh, the solar, the way the, the sun was starting on, uh, in, the, in the mountain and, and touching the vineyard. So mainly all the, many growers wants to have, never have the direct sun in the fruit zone. So we are planting in Napa Valley more and more east-west instead of north-south. But of course, this is our region. Somewhere else, it will be different. And then we saw from uh, the uh, spur pruning uh, and not, no tree system, the tree system going uh, uh, on vertical and having cordon and some uh, can pruning. And then our fruit zone were much higher. So to, to avoid the heat of the soil, and uh, we changed the rootstock and we were in the understanding that in, in the 90s and 20th, uh, 20s, 2000s, we were thinking that we should devigorate the vines instead of keeping the vigor. It was something that we thought quite it will be better. So we selected some rootstocks and we are using less and less now. So uh, we were using 1114, uh, 3309, 420A, the weaker uh, rootstock and less resistant to the, the warmth and the drought. And uh, we uh, introduced new uh, variety. Essence, essentially, in the past, we had uh, a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon and um, many other varieties like Chenin Blanc and Moscato and Gamay, but those were uh, pushed away. And uh, Cabernet Sauvignon was, is the king of Napa Valley. And then we have a little bit of Cabernet Franc. We are introducing the Petit Verdot and Merlot, of course. And so uh, the, the, the phylloxera planting has really uh, changed all of that. But we, we uh, in, in 2000 and on, we realized and we had some heat event very dramatic. I saw sometimes um, because the, the valley is protected from the ocean by the Mayakamas mountain uh, close to the west and by uh, the Vaca range, which separate us from the central valley, which is really hot. And we saw sometimes the wind blowing from the central valley to the, to the Napa valley and dropping the humidity to 10% of humidity when the temperature was warm, but okay. But that, that humidity, the Merlot couldn't resist. So we saw sometimes Merlot dehydrating 48 hours just before harvest. So all of that, we, we thought that needs to be addressed. And uh, we um, try to uh, open more the canopy 
uh, we were used to in the 2000s, we were used to delete more, export more the food for uh, for uh, maturity. We didn't want any uh, pyrazine in the wine. That was the style, that was the mode at that time. And so exposing too much the food, we were suddenly dehydrating, sunburn, and then we had to change. And um, we, um, we now we are instead of doing more vertical trellis system, we are opening the, the, the trellis system with arms. So we let the canopy protecting uh, the fruit zone. And uh, in the past, we were deleafing just like everything. Now we don't deleaf anymore. And we removed second shoot at, at the west side, so the, the, the morning sun, to, to avoid all that heat. Uh, in the 2000s, a lot of uh, some wineries liked the very short spacing, like in France, in Bordeaux, the four by four uh, feet. But the, the, the level of uh, the, the, the fruit zone was very low. And we saw a back oven effect when it was too hot. So now we are trying, it's, we, we try to avoid this system. Even if we think competition is good, um, not maybe for our uh, weather. So uh, what else are we doing? We, we are uh, doing drip irrigation, of course, more and more, and we know that. Mist, some mist uh, to avoid the heat we are using. And in addition to, um, depending where the, the vineyard is, depending the vigor of the vineyard, if, it, if the vigor of the vineyard is, not, is a little bit weak, we protect that with cheesecloth uh, to, uh, to protect from the direct sun. And in, in when it is very weak, we put some spray of a special kaolin, um, but it's not everywhere. It's just specific to site. So it's very important to understand that all our activities are specific site oriented. What else are we doing? So what I see that what is very different from the 2000 in the past is we know that we cannot manage what you don't know and what do we don't measure. So I am just thrilled to see how in the in Napa Valley, in the vineyard, there is so many activities and um, we put probes, probes for the soil to understand the, the humidity of the soil. We put probes in the canopy to understand the stress of the vines. We have uh, equipment to see what uh, leaf water potential to see when do we need to irrigate. We have uh, many, uh, we have satellite pictures. We have company which is going to teach us how to irrigate with less use of water. Uh, we have company who are using some, um, uh, some images to teach us how to understand when we have um, a smoke event in the valley, how the smoke is going to move and how, what can we do? Do we harvest before or all of, we are all tuned to this type of changes in the weather. What I'm seeing more in Napa Valley is the erratic weather. Sometimes it's super hot, sometimes it's super cold. And I always think why Napa Valley is so uh, good for uh, wines, but we have a very cold, cold uh, uh, night temperature and the fog is coming in the night and we are very lucky with that. When in the day, it's very hot and nicely, so depending uh, nicely uh, with a nice weather. So it depending of the season. So um, we are introducing some robots in the vineyard Mm -hmm. And we uh, at uh, Robert Mondavi Winery, we have purchased two Monarch tractors, which is totally um, uh, by uh, solar system uh, power. So understanding that we need to be careful. We watch compaction. We watch absolutely everything. And to conclude um, all my speech, um, <laughs> At Robert Mondavi Winery and many other wineries in Napa Valley, they, we have been aware of this uh, issue for many years. And uh, we have many activities uh, and, and we team up with the county, we team, we team up with Napa Valley, we team up with uh, all the, the uh, UC Davis. And uh, at, we are using, um, 
we have been certified at uh, the, the winery has been certified California Sustainable Wine Alliance and the Vineyard too. And uh, we have uh, we belong to the Napa Sustainable Wine Growing Group. And we have been awarded as an innovator award from California Environmental Protection Agency. So we are very much uh, tuned to always try to continue to progress with what is new and what is uh, new in the weather because we need to adapt and we are ready to continue that. And uh, I know the, um, uh, we will be um, certified organic in two years. It is not to fight the, the change in weather, but it's just to tune with nature and we are all tuned to that. So I consider Napa Valley extremely resilient and we will be because we have we went through so many changes for so many years and we will continue to do that in the future. Perfect, Genevieve, those were so many great examples of resiliency and innovation and how it is possible to adapt and, and yet dealing with really challenging issues. So thank you for that. And Aurelio, I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about your experience in Chile in terms of climate change impacts and how you've been addressing them. That's right. Okay, thank you, Alison, for, for the question. And uh, <clears throat> uh, it seems that we have uh, uh, our problems are pretty pretty similar to the ones that, that, that Genevieve has just uh, informed uh, very with a uh, big detail. And um, I would I would indicate a little bit of a difference in terms that the temperature is not growing as fast as in France, as Elizabeth just mentioned, that depending on the region of the world where you are, uh, the temperature will grow faster or slower. You, got, you have to imagine that Chile is a very long strip of land, very narrow, so we have the influence of the coast nearly in every, in every bit of, of the land that we have here. Uh, we have a very cold ocean, uh, you know, with the influence of the Humboldt current that goes from Antarctic up to Peru and then goes back. And this creates, you know, a, a, a high pressure in the ocean, <clears throat> cold temperature, high pressure, and uh, not too much growth in temperature, although there is some. I don't have the precise figures, but I imagine that if the, if the average is one degree Celsius in the last you know, 40 years, we must be around that figure or slightly less. Our problem, it's more related to watering. Uh, because of this uh, coolness of the ocean, we have a, a very high pressure in front of the central area of Chile where the grapes are produced. So all the storms and clouds coming into the continent, they are moved to the tropic to the north or even to the southern part of the country where it's very, very rainy. But the central part where we grow fruits and vineyards is pretty much affected with drought. Uh, just to give you some figures, we are in the middle of the winter now. Today is August 5th, I think. So we're in the middle of the winter. And we have had <clears throat> during this year only 20% of the normal rainfall up to uh, this date. The water reservoir that we have many up in the Andes Mountains to keep to preserve the water for the growing season, they are also at 20% of the full capacity. So we are. <clears throat> We are. Uh, uh, we have a big concern about what, what's going to happen in the in the in near immediate future for our next spring and summer. I'm afraid that it will be a very very hard, you know, season to finish well with the um, uh, properly ripe uh, grapes with a good balance between acids and sugar, and um, and all of that. So our experience goes more in how do we. Um, avoid the excess of use of water. And uh, I would say that uh, for the past 10 years, we have been experimenting and exploring <clears throat> different ways to um, avoid the excess of, of, uh, of use of water. Uh, we started with leaf removal and we, uh, we diminished the amount of leaf exposure for the, for the normal perspiration in, in spring and summer. That was one way. Uh, but we have the fruit a little bit exposed to the sun, so we have a lot of sunburn and a lot of raisins, a lot of dehydration of the fruit, 
and uh, you know, as a winemaker, that uh, it's something that I hate because you just put sugar in the in the tank, and you don't have really enough color and phenolics to get the rest of the quality of the wine. You just have sugar there. So we have been exploring a lot, and we have reached amazing results. Uh, and the thing that, that that has worked better, first of all, no more leaf removal at all because we want to protect the fruit with the same leaves. And then we are doing, you know, a kind of a summer pruning, uh, uh, bringing the shoots back to 80 centimeters or one meter at the most. Well, the shoots normally tend to grow one and a half meter or even more than that. We diminish nearly by half the, the size of the shoots. So, and then we, we, we allow the canopy to open. So we use only the fruit wires. We don't use the canopy wires. So the fruit just, uh, the canopy just opens. Uh, all the fruit is quite protected, but also it gets a lot of sunlight uh, on the meantime that the sun is moving from, from east to west. So in that way, we have reached, um, I will give you a couple of figures. Historically, we were putting 4.5 million liters per hectare in the whole season. That means 4,500 cubic meters. And now we are using close to 3,000 cubic meters which is a big amount of, uh, of water saving. And just doing the math the other day, I realized that the amount of water that we're saving is enough for about the needs of 15,000 people in a whole year. So that's really going very straightforward into being very, very sustainable. So in that matter, we have progressed a lot. Uh, in terms of moving our vineyards towards another regions, I, I would say that it's not that bad yet to start to explore, you know, uh, areas that are not really suited for, for, for vines. If we do that, we do it because there's a chance to innovate, to do different things. And uh, we are sourcing some grapes from uh, uh, about 400 kilometers south of Santiago, which is pretty south. And I just started in, 19, in 2017 a very crazy project of planting a small vineyard with seven different varieties in Patagonia, which is about a thousand kilometers south of Santiago, which is really very far. And the um, climate, it's, it's, it's harder. The rainfall goes to 1,500 millimeters here. So we have a lot of rain, but there's never been, you know, a vine ever here. So, uh, we, we found that, for example, we don't have any powdery mildew here. We don't have any um, any botrytis by the by the end of the season. <clears throat> we do have a little bit of downy mildew that it's all controlled. So uh, what we're doing it's preparing ourselves for a very severe uh, global warming, which is not which is not that severe yet in Chile, and we're trying seven different varieties. We're trying Sauvignon, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir, that are the classic varieties that we normally grow more in the, in the central part of the country. And I brought um, cuttings from uh, Spain, uh, Albariño from Galicia. We brought Pinot Grigio from uh, Northern uh, Italy. We brought uh, Riesling from, uh, from the Rhine and the Mosul River. And we brought uh, some Gewurz Traminer from Alsace. So with all, with all these seven different varieties, I'm, I am checking, you know, annually the way the plant behaves, you know, the bud burst, uh, for how long will the leaves will be, will be working, uh, the date of um, flowering, variation, and, um, and, and ripening process. Just the past uh, May, so it's two or three months ago, I did my first picking. It was a very uh, small volume yet, we are uh, doing micro vinifications to understand, you know, the amount of sugar that is converted into alcohol. How how do the acids behave? You know, very specifically the malic that it can be very very uh, uh, it's it, it's high. It's very high, you know, in in, in this region. So um, it's something very crazy, but we're preparing ourselves for uh, for a future uh, global warming. Uh, the other thing that we have been doing for the past 20 years, uh, it's been moving ourselves to the coastline, which, as uh, Genevieve explained, it, it's cooler. I think that we are cooler, even cooler than California. Uh, we got a very cold wind blowing the whole day and part of the night. 
And of course, you know, the uh, white varieties and Pinot Noir, uh, they are developing fantastically well with uh, uh, the flavors that you want to have, the acidity and the freshness of the wines, very nervous, joyful wines, very crispy. And uh, uh, because of this global warming that is not, again, I will tell you, not that severe here in Chile, but we know it's coming. Uh, we're moving some red grapes. We started with Syrah. Syrah in a cold climate grows very well uh, in a different style than the warmer regions, of course. Uh, we're trying some Merlot as well. Merlot also behaves well. It takes a little bit longer to ripen. Uh, Cabernet is not, it's not yet there. Cabernet needs a warmer climate. I don't think that Cabernet would, would work in a real cold climate. So um, in this way, we are coping with this drought and global warming that um, it's, um, it, it's, it's a matter of a high concern in everyone involved in the, in the wine industry. So this is a very general scope of what we're doing. And um, of course, during the panel on Q's and A's, uh, maybe new things will appear. <clears throat> it's, um, it's, it is so interesting to hear both of your perspectives and again, just seeing all of the ways that this is tied directly to agriculture and it always makes me think we're not only talking about wine we're talking about um you know basically our food systems as well and how we're going to adapt and i think in general the wine industry really leads the way in terms of thinking about how do we do things more sustainably and how do we address these issues so it's great to hear your specific examples and elizabeth i'm wondering if if we missed anything like anything that's maybe happening in terms of adaptation in europe or in other parts of the world that you've studied um i don't think you're missing anything i think some of the things um that mondavi has done you know obviously growers in italy are trying changing in orientation they're experimenting with how they do suckering and the shading that they do for leaves so i think a lot of the things have been brought up that most that i can think of that growers are doing um i think there's a layer of government and policy that happens in europe that we haven't touched on. So, you know, to change varieties and to change and want to irrigate in East and France, um, as well as much of Europe and the European Union is really hard. You have to change some of the government regulations about what defines a wine growing region. And I think that taps into to deep questions about what is a wine growing region. A, a journalist asked me that recently. And I didn't quite understand the question, like how will, how will wine growing regions, like will they go away? I was like, well, the, Bordeaux will always be Bordeaux to me, but I guess it depends on how we define it. The one piece I wanted to add that I think is, you know, we focus a lot on temperature with climate change because we understand it well. We, we have tremendous long-term records. We understand shifts in precipitation a little less well. We have much shorter records. Um, and then we understand even less changes in fog. So I think a lot of the climates that were mentioned here about Chile, uh, certainly a little bit of Napa, definitely Sonoma, are fog influenced climates. They're dependent on the ocean. And it's just a wide open box about whether we maintain the same sort of fog system that maintains a certain cooler climate with um, climate change. I think that's a big unknown for anyone working in a fog dominated region. Really important point, thanks. So I want to turn a little bit to the broader topic of sustainability now. Um, both California and Chile, along with many other wine regions in the world, have developed sustainability programs that provide education and or certification. And these programs really do address so many of the issues we've talked about, energy and water use, um, soil health, air quality issues, many other issues that are directly tied to climate change. And even just in California, about 80% of all of California wine is made in a certified California sustainable winery. And a third of the acreage is certified to our program. And there are other programs like Napa Green and SIP certified and Lodi Rules. So more than half is certified to one of those programs. And really, um, again, if, if you're certified, you are implementing climate smart practices. You're measuring performance metrics. Um, Genevieve talked about the importance of measuring to manage. Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit about Aurelio. I know that your vineyard is certified sustainable wine of Chile. And can you give an example of just some of your general sustainable practices that you're using? I know that I think you do dry farming and you use grazing animals and things like that. There we go. There it goes. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, listen, we, we are certified, you know, sustainable. We believe a lot in being sustainable um, here on the future and going as deep as possible in, in all the um, uh, different, you know, areas of the, uh, of the wine production. <clears throat> First of all, I think that what's very important is what I just explained about, you know, saving water, uh, uh, trying different uh, rootstocks, uh, uh, low, lowering the, the, um, the length of the shoots to have less leaves. Of course, you know, the production of these uh, uh, vines are, are, um, are, are lower than they used to be. I'm speaking of seven to nine tons per hectare. Um, so um, that's, I would say, one of the main things that, that we are doing. Uh, another thing that I could mention is that we're using 100% <clears throat> of uh, clean energy produced by uh, uh, renewable sources. Uh, Chile is one of the countries that is going uh, uh, the faster, I would say, in the whole world or nearly in the whole world. Today, we have a 35% of the whole energy that the country uses is sold by solar, wind or water. So it's all renewable and, and clean. In our case, we decided to buy to the electric company the 100% of, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the clean energy that they uh, I have disposable uh, that they, they, they have, you know, uh, to, to sell. So we're buying, uh, we're self-producing part of it with solar panels and the rest that we cannot uh, produce by, by ourselves, we buy it from the um, distributors of energy and it's only clean, which is more expensive, but it's uh, the way to go in my, uh, in my view. Uh, we have reduced, you know, the waste in general, all the, uh, disposable, uh, disposable things that we use, uh, that we can have in the winery. We have uh, uh, we're doing a big amount of compost uh, with our own, you know, uh, grape skins and uh, and the um, and, and the green part of the of the of the bunch as well. Um, we are uh, 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 treating our water, you know, the one that we used in the company in the in the um, at the level of the winery. Is going through a very clean process with what we call pools, with um, wood shavings and, and little worms that actually we call them the Californian ones because, because they are pretty, pretty red. And, um, and the water is uh, recycled from big pools to these um, kind of big pools with, uh, with shavings and worms. And the water really becomes a very uh, easy reusable water mainly for the um, irrigation purposes a, at the level of the, um, of the, of the vineyards. Um, we have, you know, Chile is a very mountainous country. We have mountains everywhere. We have the Andes, the coastal range, and we have mountains everywhere you go. So uh, part of our own estates, we have around uh, 1,000 hectares of vineyards. That means about 2,000 acres. And we have uh, more or less the same extent of hillsides. So we have a program of reforesting and planting trees, native trees especially, uh, at the hillsides where there's nothing to, uh, to bring more uh, a carbon neutral, you know, uh, winery. Um, in terms of, uh, we, we think that, it, that it in, in, the, in the concept of sustainability, you know, uh, going in the technical part of the environment is as important as a social thing. We are very close to our people. We have programs running uh, for the workers that haven't uh, finished their studies so they can finish them in a special, in a special program with, with teachers. We have scholarships for the kids of our workers to go to university if they have performed well in school. So uh, that's also very important and people really appreciate that. Um, we have a kind of a sponsorship with two small rural schools that we have nearby the winery. And we uh, provide books for the library and we provide instruments as well for the little orchestra that the little boys have there. So that's uh, very important. And uh, of course, we have uh, been certified for fair trade, uh, sustainable, good manufacturing uh, practices. So all, all, all this added together, you know, makes us to be really very, uh, very sustainable. And last but not least, you know, the third pillar that is very important in being sustainable is being profitable as a company, because you need to pay your workers 
on time and good salaries. If you are not profitable, you don't have the right to live. You have, you have to disappear as a company. So that's the third pillar that we respect a lot. And we, uh, we export 95% of our production. We're an exporter company. We export to 110 countries around the world. And we keep our price policy, you know, good enough to have profit in the balance sheet and share that with, uh, of course, you know, the, uh, the shareholders and our workers as well at the end of the year. So all the addition of this makes ourselves to be one of the most sustainable wineries in the country. Fantastic. You did such a good job of giving examples in all three pillars of sustainability. So wonderful. And Genevieve, I, you already mentioned that your winery is certified California Sustainable and now your vineyards are Napa Green as well as certified sustainable and so many different ways that I know that you're demonstrating that you're using sustainable practices. But can you give us some examples of on the ground work that you're doing? Can you unmute? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, at the winery, we are Napa Green, uh, Napa Green. So we have uh, we are recycling every things, and we are pro producing as not uh, a, a wine or um, or something that we can um, do. So all the pomas, all the stems all the cardboards, uh, the glasses that we don't use uh, are going to recyclable company, taking it and recycling them. And we have changed all the, the bulbs to lead. So we are trying to be as good as possible to be to be a Napa Green uh, certified every three years. We, are, we have been certified. And um, for the uh, for the, the vineyard, we, are, we will be um, a certified organic in, in two years. So everything is uh, watching insecticide watching, fertilizer watching, uh, herb and uh, herbicide, uh, trying not to, um, to compact too much the, the, the soil. Um, we, we, we are going to change the system of uh, reusable water in two years. Our pond will have a new system. So definitely the machine is going on and we will continue that. So since I know this winery, it has been always progressing to the next chapter to be closer and closer to the, to the mother nature. And uh, we call that the holistic approach of, uh, of making wine, which start in, with nature, the vineyard and the winery. And then we are going to, uh, the, the, when the wine is bottled, uh, we go to the table and the friendship of everybody. So there is a big study about um, the, the, the CO2 impact uh, of glasses on the road, um, vehicle, all of that is, going is studying now and big time. Excellent. And I was just thinking one of the other benefits of some of these programs that you all belong to is really disseminating information through the entire industry. So some of the great practices that you've been talking about as a way to ensure everyone's meeting those standards, um, they're learning about new innovative approaches. And I know that for California and Chile, we've partnered through a group called FIVS to develop an international greenhouse gas protocol um, and just done a lot of really good work. I think that could continue um, in terms of international collaboration to advance these efforts. So I, I now would like to turn just quickly to marketing and um, basically consumer and trade interest in sustainability. And so I want to do again make this a little bit interactive so i'd love for everyone to take a quick response to the poll that black will pull up and um, that indicates to the what to what extent you consider sustainability including efforts to reduce your carbon footprint when you purchase wine so we'll just take a minute to do that um you are talking to me right i uh, or, oh no just to uh, the uh, audience okay. as a whole okay. yeah sorry because no problem. In those type of pool. The panelists can answer too. <laughs> we'll 
give it another second and we'll pull up the responses. All right, so 38% said that they frequently choose wines based on that one, that, that is a factor and 44% occasionally, 3% never, which is actually really interesting because um, we've done some work with wine intelligence to better understand consumer interest in sustainably produced and or certified wines. And about 71% of US wine drinkers said that they would consider buying sustainably produced wine and nine in 10 millennials are willing to pay more for sustainable wine. Basically that younger consumer, the millennials and Gen Z view sustainability as increasingly important. And we also did some research with Full Glass Research and the Wine Opinions Trade Panel and found really similar responses. So 32% of trade, including retailers and restaurant tours and others, um, occasionally, and 50% say it's, uh, um, wait, I'm sorry, 32% said frequently, 50% said occasionally it's a factor when they purchase wine, and only 3% said never. So very similar results there. I think that the early stages of sustainability really were about continuous improvement of businesses and of the industry and really responding to pu public policy issues and, and less so the market, but it is interesting to see how well positioned wine is to be able to respond to consumer and trade demand for sustainability. And I'm curious, um, either Genevieve or Aurelio, if you have any, any response to the fact that there is this consumer demand, are you changing anything about how your product is presented in your packaging or how you produce it or how you're communicating it? Would either of you like to go first? Okay, I can, I can give you a little bit of an answer. Um, I was just wondering <clears throat> how was sustainable or organic or biodynamic maybe 25 or 30 years ago? Maybe people had no concern, they wouldn't care about this. And it's a, it's a thing that is growing, it's growing uh, very fast. And I'm sure that in a short period, five or 10 years more, maybe there will be no wine that will be sell without any sort of, of certification of being, you know, a product that is produced with a concern about, you know, how the globe, you know, the earth, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's evolving and all these problems that we have talked about. Um, in, in our case, uh, as Montes Winery, we are using tremendously uh, well, very strongly, you know, the, uh, uh, all the uh, um, internet and all the media, all the uh, digital media, you know, through all the uh, platforms that we are able to use to promote, you know, how concerned we are, we are about <clears throat> uh, the, um, the fact of being or not being sustainable. On the other hand, I am the head of uh, Wines of Chile, you know, there's an organization that gathers together all the vineyards. And I can tell you that 85% of our associates, they are already certified and they count for about 75 or to 80% maybe of the whole exports that go out from Chile. And Chile exports a lot of wine, exports 400 million liters per year, bottled wine, I mean, in addition of the pot wine. So it's something very important and we're working very hard in a logo. We want to explain because being sustainable is hard. You have three different pillars. When you say organic, it's organic and that's it. And you tend to understand very easily. But when it's sustainable, you have to, uh, to explain to people, you know, uh, that it's environment, that it's a social and it's a, a pro profitability. And people don't want to listen uh, five minutes of an explanation in front of a bottle. They want to get something easy to understand and just go for the bottle and buy it. So as Wines of Chile, we're working a lot, you know, with uh, developers and trying to, um, to produce a logo that would be very easy to understand for the consumer. So every time you see the logo, we just go and grab a bottle and, uh, and you uh, are buying a bottle that is certified in some, in some way. But we think that the future, it's too important you know, not to do something. So um, that's why we are pretty involved in, in, uh, in, this, in this topic. Excellent. It sounds like you have different drivers, which I think a lot of wineries do. Um, Genevieve, what about you? So uh, regarding this question, as a winemaker, uh, we are trying to uh, address the issue of 
harvesting not too late and we have done for a long time so i'm just specializing in making wine more than uh, promoting uh, the the bottles i know we are uh, robert mandavi winery is on all the social uh, media uh, podium and they are promoting uh, the sustainability of the farming and the winery but we are we are we want to develop uh, the new style of our wine which will be with uh, a very approachable uh, approachable wine with uh, less alcohol but with the same type of uh, mouthfeel and so uh, we are working toward that goal as a winemaker at the winery and in the vineyard and uh, the rest the company is working just right now to analyze all the impact of uh, glasses in transportation and they are promoting our all our certifications that's for sure and so i consider we, we have been a very good steward of the of the of the land and of the the people and continuing for the future generation because the idea is not just us it's what is going to happen with our impact on on what we are doing now what will be the the repercussion in 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. And definitely we are watching that. Great, thank you. And we have just a couple minutes left. So I was looking through some of the questions in the q and I think we covered a number of these in terms of carbon offsets. At least I know Aurelio mentioned how they're doing that. Um, or Genevieve, are you doing anything in terms of offsetting your carbon footprint? Um, we we are doing uh we are we have we the way we do is we analysis everything and we are in that mode so yes definitely we are watching uh, what will be on uh, the vehicle that the company is using so uh we will be uh, electric vehicle and of course it takes time just to set up this this system so everybody is going to use a company vehicle will be uh, obliged to give and to transform all that CO2 um, impact and understand what we are doing. So we are doing less traveling. We are doing more Zoom like we are doing today. So there is definitely an understanding of uh, what was the past, how we were using us airplanes and traveling and, and uh, driving everywhere and then the company will give us some electric vehicle but it's not tomorrow it will take a few years to implement this program excellent so um there were a couple of questions about trade-offs so one of them was about wine so either of you're welcome to answer and it's about are, are winemakers choosing to harvest grapes earlier to contain sugar levels and hence alcohol at the expense of phenolic maturity or are they choosing to have full grape maturity knowing that they will get higher sugar levels and they understand that you know this choice varies depending on many factors but do you have a response to that uh is, is it from the question is for me either of you okay so just let's say for for us we we have never been late late harvest or uh, trying to do a mouthfeel with uh mature fruit so we are balancing and we work very closely with the vineyard manager because the, the key is in the vineyard and they understand totally our style and what we are looking for so we are not going to harvest too late and we are not we are not harvesting too early so far but we are harvesting such a way that the, the role of the vineyard manager is to bring the fruit for the winemakers and to bring it at the winery the way we are looking for the style and this our style will be fresh and fruity to be able to maintain the fruit and maintain the acidity and maintain uh, all of that it will be uh, more on the early side usually we are one of the first harvest in Cabernet Sauvignon in the, in the Napa Valley but because of the Tocano vineyard we are very lucky the maturity of the fruit is excellent. We have very low yield, so and and the management of the canopy is really good. So I feel very comfortable to say that in our style we will will be on a lower side alcohol. Of course, much higher than uh, forty years ago, but not as high as the rest of some style because it's all about style and all about responsibilities. Great, and Aurelio, I was going to ask you a question. Another one about trade offs. Someone said, are there any instances in which decisions to address climate change 
are in conflict with current sustainability standards. And they used the example of genetically modified organisms, but to my knowledge, um, GMOs are not permitted for use for commercial production in either California or Chile, but you might have another response to that, maybe another example of where there's a trade-off. Yeah, I don't think there, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, 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 to look for something in my mind. And I just don't find anything that would be a trade-off between being sustainable and the production of wines. Um, <clears throat> I would say that uh, I totally agree with uh, Genevieve in terms that we're looking for uh, less alcohol, but being very careful because there is a double speech here. Uh, people always say that they prefer low alcohol because of health issues, but at the end when you when you put in the market a wine that it's uh, 12 or 12.5 alcohol with uh, unripe phenolics, you know, that you will have a big complaint. So, so, so people say one thing, but they react, they, they, don't, they don't walk the talk, actually. Uh, they, um, they, they react differently to the wine. The commercial issue is different to what people do say, and, and of course, lots of, of uh, journalists. So, so there's a trade-off between the level of alcohol and producing a product that is palatable, nice, and then you want to have a second glass or a second bottle with food, of course. Um, <clears throat> I don't see any other issue in which uh, moving towards sustainability would uh, work against the production or the image of the product. I would say that on the other way, anything that you do in terms of being sustainable, it's, it, it only helps you know, the image of your company and the image of your brand and of your wines. Um, but again, we have to be very careful in this double speech of people that say they want no barrels, uh, low alcohol and so on. And if you produce that wine, it's all back to your winery. <laughs> when you ship it out, you know, it will be returned to the wine. Say, well, this is not the wine that it was used to drink. So uh, there's a uh, a, a trade a very thin line in which you have to walk uh, to get um, a, a, a good nice wine with a well balanced uh, ratio between alcohol acidity and phenolics in general. Perfect. And I'm just going to wrap up with a fast one because someone asked how they could find out more about certified wines or where to look for them. And we do have a website, sustainablewinegrowing.us, that has all of the US programs included. Um, CaliforniaSustainableWine.com has a searchable database where you can look for certified vineyards, wineries, and wines. And then I know that Chile and South Africa and Australia, all of the other countries that have programs also have websites that if you search for sustainable wine growing, certified, those types of words, you'll find all of them. So with that, I will turn it back to Todd and thank you so much to all of you, Genevieve and Aurelio for your perspectives and also for Elizabeth bringing the science. We really appreciate your time and thanks for including me. All right, fantastic. Um, as, as, as I suspected, it was a very wonderful conversation. I certainly can, can't thank all the panelists enough for joining Aurelio from Chiloé Island. Allison and Genevieve, I'm assuming from uh, from from wine country, California, and Elizabeth from you know I guess I'm going to assume uh, BC. I, my mind always means Vancouver, but somewhere in British Columbia. So thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you for everyone that joined. And what an eclectic group! I mean, we literally had people coming in from Vietnam, Ethiopia, the UAE, Spain, the US, the UK, Indonesia, Mexico, France, Germany, the Cayman Islands, of Romania, and those are just the folks who answered the question for me where they were coming into. So again, I thank our panelists. I thank everybody that did join um, remotely. Um, certainly if there's any questions that weren't answered, we will have those and we will be very happy to get answers for you. We wanna thank all of our sponsors, including uh, Montez Wines, um, certainly out of Chile as being our presenting partner at Trees and Seas. Once again, this was part of the Trees and Seas Festival um, organized by Plastic Oceans and Uno, which is a wonderful lifestyle brand out of Chile as well. Um, also in collaboration with Avocado Green Mattress, EcoWatch, and One Tree Planted. One Tree Planted, a wonderful um, nonprofit organization um, that all about reforestation. EcoWatch, a great source for environmental news if you're looking for that on a day-to-day -day basis, so make sure you check them out. 
Okay, our winners of the books will be announced in just one second here. Sorry, Vlatka, I think I went a little bit out of, of, of order here for you, but if we could go ahead, there we go. Bailey Roberts, Eric Harris, Lara Truscott, Oscar Maralanda, and Zoe, I'm gonna say Aranopoulos, um, where the winners, those books will be sent out to you by early next week. Uh, we do wanna remind you about, um, excuse me, our next uh, panel tomorrow, this is gonna be at 11 a.m. Eastern time, uh, which I believe is 3 p.m. GMT. Um, and this is called Youth Perspectives. We have five amazing young people from around the world. Most of us are probably familiar with like Greta Thunberg and a few others, uh, but there's really a, a, a score of amazing young people who are just doing amazing things um, to, 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 to protect our planet. So tune in for that tomorrow. The one on Friday at the same time is basically using creativity as a voice for the planet. Um, we've got some amazing people on there, including actor Matthew Modine, Asher Jay, who's a wonderful visual artist, and Nat Geo Explorer, um, Mahani Tayavi, a wonderful uh, uh, classical pianist. Um, so it's really, and, and I'm sorry, also Marissa Quinn, who's our official artist, and I don't know if Aurelio has seen it, but she's done an amazing piece of artwork depicting Chiloé Island um, that I think um, I'll be sure to send you um, some visuals on that, Aurelio. It's a really beautiful piece of artwork. So um, with that, I again, welcome everyone to Trees and Seas. If you don't know what it is, go to PlasticOceans.org. You'll find out all about it. There's 30 locations around the world. Once again, Montes Wines is our presenting sponsor. I thank everybody and until tomorrow, uh, stay tuned for more. Thank you so much.